Welcome to r slash pro revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with pro revenge after being wronged. Today's first story is, oh my god, we're so sorry we blocked your doorway. Now go get your earmuffs. I've had a long respectable career in game development. A couple of years ago I've abandoned it for a cushy corporate job and now spend most of my days missing game dev. This story takes place about 10 years ago at the apex of my career. I was the lead on a AAA project. Our parent company, for which video games was just one of many lines of business, was going through changes. We had to move offices three times in one year. Second of the three moves, always intended to be temporary, put us into the basement of an older building, long occupied by satellite departments not involved with development. The basement we were given had been empty for years, save for the most distant office. You entered the basement through a dimly lit staircase. Then after you snake through a horror movie-like maze of corridors and interconnected small rooms, you'd eventually arrive at the farthest room of all. A golden plaque was on the door. Trademark Compliance Department. Literally no one knew I was ever aware of trademark compliance, even though trademarks were a pretty important part of everything we did. The department consisted of a single elderly trademark attorney and his fresh-faced college grad assistant, paralegal, whatever. The lawyer flipped his friggin' SH when he learned people were being moved into his basement. For a couple of weeks he tried desperately to prevent the move, getting all the way to the CEO. The tiny leathery lawyer amazed everyone with his deep booming voice that would climb and climb and climb in pitch as he yelled and screamed and threatened. So all his efforts being for naught, our stuff was moved into the basement over one weekend. We spent the following Monday and Tuesday dealing with all sorts of setup woes, electrical outlets, network connections, breathable air. On Wednesday, two quiet 2D artists came into their L-shaped room, the one with the fancy door to trademark compliance, and found that all their stuff, chairs, desks, computers, everything was pushed into the far corner. A walkway of caution tape was set up leading to the compliance door. While we were trying to figure out what the heck happened, a demigod VP, as close to the company CEO as it gets, walked into our lowly basement, trailed by the beaming lawyer. Apparently our desks blocked his door, he even had pictures. The demigod hadn't seen them prior to walking down. Once he saw dozens and dozens of close-ups of the desk corner, the VP's face grew less certain. Our desk was blocking his doorway by less than an inch on the side with the hinges. The doorway opened from the desk. I'm guessing even when open at 90 degrees, the edge of the door was about as wide as the protruding part of the desk. In other words, it was technically blocking the doorway, but no more so than the door itself. Non-committal as always, the demigod instructed us to make sure all pathways were clear at all times, and that he expected this would be the last time he had to get involved. I'm generally a people pleaser. I can even sympathize with an old guy freaking out when a gaggle of man children in ironic t-shirts wreck his long-established way of life. I figured it was time to modify the seating chart. Two people would be a pretty tight fit for that weird room, and I also didn't want my quiet flower child artists anywhere near that loon. I apologized to the lawyer and told him I was moving two people out and moving just one person in, making sure it was as uncluttered as possible. I had two potential candidates in mind, and while leaning strongly towards one, I considered a milder option in case the lawyer turned out to be an alright guy after all. The lawyer answered my apology with a triumphant serves you right, and a that's what you get for messing with adults, and welcome to the real world, and this is far from over. He then ordered me to wait right here, and came out with a tape measure. We snaked through his entire path from the staircase to his office, measuring clearance from desks and chairs and people's items, and the lawyer booped desks and monitors and garbage cans and pushed people sitting in their chairs, as if they were garbage cans. He crawled on the floor and marked out no man's land in chalk. No one was ever allowed to block his pathway, or he'd have everyone's jobs. Once all the lines were drawn and the lawyer retreated to his fortress of smugness, I knew our slightly unhinged physics programmer with his anime posters and the loud clank of his mechanical keyboard would not be moving to the room after all. My revenge was going pro. Now the issue of sound was discussed more than any other, as we were planning the temporary move. Our sound designer had to listen to all sorts of sounds at full volume on different types of speakers, and not just on his headphones. If sound was designed on headphones and you played it on surround speakers, you'd sense it. Our old office had a professionally soundproof room. Even then, that was a pretty unpleasant thing. Huge sounds could not be heard, but could be felt. Like in an audible earthquake, it struck you with primal dread. So we discussed this on and on and on. I wanted a soundproof room. Management wanted headphones. We eventually agreed on a compromise. We just have to accept screams and explosions on speakers while we're in the basement. This decision had also been made and approved by the same VP, about a month before the walkway and chalk incident. You already see where I'm going with this. We made the walkway semi-permanent with construction tape. I took pictures and sent an update email to everyone reporting that A, we pledged to keep all pathways clear at all times, and B, the offending room would have the two girls move out and only have the sound designer move in. VP replied with, thank you, that's great. 
See how the email listed the sound designer in an offhand way? This was not my first rodeo. We moved the sound designer and all his equipment into the room. The next morning explosion started, then stopped. High-pitched screams in the distance. Footsteps. My door flew open and the lawyer ran in screaming, what the F? He dragged me across the street to the VP's office. VP was not there. The lawyer screamed and jumped and stomped his little feet, left voicemails, then retreated to write an email to the VP, with CC list possibly going all the way up to President Obama and the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. I quickly replied that 1. Sound design issues had been extensively discussed and were deemed a necessary evil. 2. I notified everyone before the fact the sound designer was moving to that particular room. And 3. If I had to keep moving people around every day, I wouldn't be able to hit my milestones. VP replied the next morning, saying he's right about milestones. Besides, it's temporary anyway. And so for the next 7 months, compliance department was subjected to 8 hours a day of non-stop explosions, gunfire, screams, grunts, engine roar, and wet thuds. Once released, our game's sound design was singled out for praise in multiple reviews. I put the lawyer's name somewhere in the midst of the thank you section in the credits. The second story is, someone stole 25k from me. It ended costing him half a million dollars. A preamble. I was married to a very OCD and pragmatic man. For example, for him, a big romantic gesture had been to leave me alone for 24 hours at the hospital, right after I had our son, so he could go pay bills and mow the lawn. 20 years later, I do understand he really did express love this way, but that's another story. I was in dire need of physical contacts because he'd never touched me, unless he wanted very bland sex, and also never ever kissed me. The story is not about him, it's only a preamble. So, I divorced him, not just for what's above, mind you, I felt alone and unloved in this relationship. I just wrote about it to explain the state of mind I was in, when I met this other person that we'll call P.S. P.S. was the total opposite, he was very in tune with his emotions. He was very, very intense. This will be important later. He really expressed love like I thought I needed. On our first date, the waitress asked how long we had been together since he was so into me and touching me. He made me feel amazing. He had a huge house and a rather flashy lifestyle, so I assumed he was really well off. He told me he owned a car wash and a phone marketing company. Fast forward a bit. At this point, we had been dating for about a year, and he had just asked me and my son to move in with him. I wasn't 100% sure, but he prepared the room for my son nonetheless. As I started spending more time in his house, still keeping mine, I also started to see strange behavior. He'd be up all night, but sleep all day. I also overheard a few phone calls where he was telling people they owed money and needed to pay, but the conversations didn't fit with a car wash or phone marketing business. At some point, he told me he was having money problems. He said huge clients were late in paying and that it was jeopardizing his house payments. So I, stupid me, offered to help. I'm missing a part of this story because it started as me offering help with the house, since we were there a lot. Still had my house though, but it ended up with me lending him 25k. I cannot for the life of me remember that progression. The loan was supposed to be for 3 weeks, he said. I'd have it all back in 3 weeks. 3 weeks. That 25k came from my retirement savings and son's college money, so I had to pay a fine to access it. It's also money it took me 10 years to put aside. That money was very important to me. During those 3 weeks, I went out to have drinks with my friends and found him on a date with another woman. I saw him French kissing another woman. I said nothing, went to his house, packed my SH and left. So anyway, I thought he'd be an adult and would still reimburse the 25k at the end of this three weeks. Big mistake. Someone I knew told me he was glad I left and proceeded to tell me about him. He said PS was a junkie, hooked on GHB, hence why he was so intense and so into his emotions. That also explained the erratic sleep and night patterns. But the final blow was when he told me PS was also a con man, a specialist in defrauding older people by phone, his so-called phone marketing company. In the beginning, I wasn't sure I believed it, but then bits of what I had overheard in the last year started to make sense, and I realized it was all true. Back to this later. I tried having my money back many different ways. None worked. I was at the end of my rope, and since it was in my years post-divorce, and right after the 2008 to 2009 economic crash as well, I was poor as heck. So this is what I did. First, he had given me access to pay bills online, not to his bank accounts, but to his emails, so I was able to investigate all his accounts with the same password. I printed and screenshotted every little bit of information relating to money. I found proof that he was indeed scamming people and found the people he worked with and even the name of the person at Western Union who facilitated the money transfer. I found out he was an organized criminal. I also found out he did this between the two countries. I started preparing strike one. Strike one. So for strike one, I printed his face and the face of everyone working for and with him from their online profiles in defrauding people and left hundreds of flyers in his neighborhood. I also called the hotline for financial crime prevention in both the countries and gave very specific details and names. 
Know that even if he had given me the money, this goes against my core values, and I would have done the same thing either way. At this point, I was preparing strike two, too. Strike two. I was dumb in lending him money, but at least I did it the right way. I wrote a check. I didn't do cash. I wanted proof just in case. It would turn out to be a great idea. On the check, I had written that it was a loan. Thank you, Judge Judy, for this tip. Since he didn't pay me back, I prepared an invoice and sent it to me from his hacked email. When the time came to do my taxes, I filed the 25 k as an expense using this invoice. I have many freelancers. I slid him as one of them, and it passed. Don't ask me how I got his social security number. I can't remember, but I ended up having access to it, so ratted him out to the IRS for hiding income. I found out later through friends that the IRS started investigating him for unpaid taxes. I heard he had to pay 38% taxes on that 25 k plus pay a 20% fine for not declaring income. At this point I was satisfied. I figured $9,500 in taxes, plus 5 k in fines, was 50% of what he owed me. At least he didn't get away with it all. But remember I told you on the check I had written that it was a loan? So I took about 2-3 to three years, but I took him to court and won. He didn't even show up, so he has to reimburse the full 25 k plus court fees, plus what he owes to the IRS, so it's $39,500 that he has to pay for not reimbursing 25 k To this day I still haven't seen a cent, but the rest of the story makes it worthwhile. For a while I thought the financial crime call I made had no effect. Now the cherry on top. What I didn't know at the time is that the IRS would team up with Wire Fraud Division and look at everything he did. They were not able to catch him on the wire fraud, but since the house he had did not fit with the money he was declaring, they got him on tax evasion and gave him a certain delay to pay back taxes. I heard it was only three months, but I don't know if it's accurate. They got him so good they ended up freezing his accounts and he lost his house. The bank foreclosed it and his debt to the IRS is still open. We're not in the US, so he won't go to jail for this however. But my 25k that he did not want to repay ended up costing him over half a million dollars. And since you cannot go bankrupt for a debt you owe to the government, I'm happy to tell you that at 40 years old, he had to move back with his parents and ask for welfare and will probably be paying this for the rest of his life. This story is not finished however. I just learned that he now has a job as a concierge in the apartment building of his parents, so I'll be contacting the court to have the money he owes me taken directly from his pay. The thing is, he has no idea I'm the culprit of all his bad fortune, and he recently sent me a message telling me he misses me, that I was an angel for him, and that he regrets what he did. Well, not me, loser. Not me. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.